On this week's 51%, we celebrate women in dance. We speak with a student at Juilliard and take some lessons from a professional ballroom dancer. It feels like therapy. It's dancing is definitely therapy. We all love to dance, even if we have two left feet. Once you know we play the music, anybody can dance. We also speak with choreographer Helen Pickett and get a glimpse of her creative process. It's all next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jesse King. Today is all about women in dance. A lot of us may have taken dance classes as kids or simply just danced to the radio like I did. But today we're speaking with women who kept at it and are working to make a living out of it. So grab some good shoes and a partner if you can, because we're taking a lesson as well. We'll start down in New York City with Nyoka Watterson. Watterson is an African-American dancer who grew up in the city, and when we spoke to her, she was settling into her first year at Juilliard. But really, she's been dancing since she was just three years old. I used to walk around on my tippy toes when I was younger, and my mom always tells me that she just saw me and was like, she needs to be in dance classes immediately. She clearly wants to pursue that. (laughs) And so she did. She put me in dance classes, and I've been dancing ever since. I went to LaGuardia for dance, which is the high school right across the street from Juilliard. So I've been dancing my whole life. Watterson is trained in ballet, jazz, pop, and more, but she says gram technique is currently her favorite. Gram is a technique created by Martha Gram. It really revolves around the contraction, which is like the hauling out of your stomach. It's a very physical technique that includes floor work, and it's been around for a long time. There's a Graham school based in New York and the Graham Company. Dance gives me the ability to be free and to say things with my physicality that I probably would not either be confident saying or be able to say with words. It allows me to just express myself in a way that I love. Someone said this the other day, when you're dancing, You're doing it for yourself. Other people are just lucky enough to be able to see. And I think with that mentality, dance can be one of the most powerful things. Watterson lists Alicia Graf Mack and Misty Copeland as some of her biggest role models. She loves watching and studying confident Black dancers because the field in many ways is still predominantly white. She says a lot of it comes down to representation and accessibility. Becoming a professional dancer requires years of full-time, expensive training. And oftentimes, the families who can afford that are wealthy and white. Growing up, Watterson was one of a few Black dancers in her classes, and she never really registered the effect it had on her until she got to Juilliard. In 2017, Juilliard tapped Graf Mack to lead its dance division, and Watterson credits her with increasing the diversity within the school's student population. Watterson believes her class is the program's most diverse yet, with a third of its roughly 24 students being people of color. And in being among all those equally talented dancers who look more like her, Watterson said she was forced to confront some of her past insecurities. I found that in previous years, I didn't always feel confident in my ballet. I mean, a large part of it probably was because I would see all these white faces at the front of the room having perfect turnout and all the ballet techniques that they had. And I didn't feel like I was as strong in that field. I remember at my interview for my Juilliard audition, Alicia told me, she said, I love watching you at the bar. I love watching you in ballet, but you didn't move your face. So he didn't smile once. And I was so focused. And then she said, but when we started the modern, you, your face lit up. You were excited and happy. And I think that's partly because I was so focused on wanting to fit the perfect mold of what a ballerina usually looks like. I didn't think I could just be me and still fit that image. But I think that's changing in the dance world in general. More Black faces are coming to the forefront and saying, talking about things they've been through and how they overcame it, and finding confidence in your technique and your art and yourself. Watterson points to her point shoes as one way the field is slowly but surely changing. 
For people of color, finding point shoes to match your skin tone can be incredibly difficult. The whole purpose of point shoes is to create an illusion of long limbs, to extend the lines a dancer makes as they move across the floor. And if you're a person of color and all you have is pink shoes for white dancers, that illusion is shattered. As a result, many dancers, even some white dancers, paint or pancake their shoes with makeup. In 2019, major shoe companies like Capizio and Block pledged to start using brown satin in their dance shoes, but Watterson hopes to see more thorough representation going forward. For anyone wanting to get in a dance, her advice is simple. Go for it. Do it, but do the work. If you're going to do it, know that it's hard. Know that there are going to be days you do not want to dance. But then when you get in the studio and you finish class, you're going to be so happy that you did. Dance is one of the most difficult and grueling art forms, not only physically, but also mentally. And I think if you don't have the confidence of believing in yourself and knowing that you have the ability to achieve any goals you have, then it's going to be a lot harder to succeed in this field. But I think being a dancer can give you so much confidence if you let it. As Watterson said, making dance look effortless takes a lot of hard work. The physical strength, coordination, stamina, and focus involved is just like what you see in athletes. And for some people, dancing is a sport. While it's not at the Olympics, dance sport or competitive ballroom dancing has been around for well over 100 years. And with the COVID-19 vaccine, competitions are ramping back up at both a national and international level. If you're wondering what some of these competitions look like, think of the TV show Dancing with the Stars, which helped bring ballroom dance back to a mainstream audience in 2005. But here, couples often take the floor at the same time. There's a lot more judges, much stricter judging. And the dancers have been training for years, if not their entire lives. Five, six, seven, eight, slow. Quick, quick, slow. Quick, quick, slow. At 27 years old, Natalia O'Connor has represented multiple countries on the competitive dance floor, and along with her husband Florin, she's operated Dance Fire Studio and Fitness in Niskayuna, New York, since 2017. The pair are actually fresh off a win at a national championship in Orlando, Florida. But in between competitions, they teach groups, engaged couples, and kids everything from the waltz to the tango. I recently sat down with O'Connor to learn how she got started. I had a very interesting life, so um, my dad is American and my mom is Russian. So I started dancing in Philadelphia. Uh, I was eight years old, I was watching TV, and then I, we ended up watching a competition on TV, and I told my mom that I wanted to go and try it out. And from then, it's all, it's all history, you know, I just fell in love. And at the age of 10, uh, my parents, they divorced, so uh, we made a decision to move to St. Petersburg, Russia. So it was definitely a cultural shock for me. It was very different. I knew a little bit of Russian, obviously, because my mom was Russian, but not as good for school and, you know, to live comfortably. Dancing definitely helped me to uh, overcome that and to, you know, be part of a dance community, to have friends, and just overall create the person I am today. What was it about ballroom dancing that you loved so much? Well, definitely it's the expression, so you can express yourself without actually saying any words. And confidence, yeah, it definitely helps you with the confidence. And overall, your social skills, because, you know, when you're a little girl, you don't feel really comfortable talking to boys, and uh, it just makes you feel more comfortable with people and more open. It made a huge difference in my life, yes. How is it different doing dance in Russia versus doing dance here? Well, it's definitely more strict. <laughs> it's a little bit more strict. It was, uh, the style of teaching is different, but it was a wonderful experience. I think I toughened up. And uh, actually from the age of 16, I was able to live on my own and to become more independent. And actually after Russia, I moved to Romania where I met my dance partner and now my husband. We were dancing for the Romanian national team for a few years, so I lived with him from the age of 16. I actually lived with his family. And then after a few disappointing results, we realized that the opportunity wasn't there. And um, because I am an American citizen, we were allowed to transfer and to represent the United States. So at the age, I believe, of 18, 19, maybe 20, 
we moved to the United States. We started first, we would travel back and forth because we were competing a lot in Europe, Asia, and then the States. So we would come, let's say, for about three months and stay with my grandparents who live in Vermont. But then at, after, I think when we turned 21, we decided to move to the U.S. and to you know start our lives here, uh, open our own dance studio, which was always a dream of mine. And we're, we're so happy to live in this area. How do those competitions usually work? Like, what are they judging you on? It's a combination of everything. Besides your technique, it's your musicality, it's your partnership, or your stamina, because dancing is actually a very physical activity. So that's why it's called, in the competitive world, it's called dance sport. And actually, it is recognized by the Olympic Committee. And hopefully soon we'll be an Olympic sport. It's about dance, but you're also running a business. How is it for you on that end? Like, what's the experience been? It is a lot of work, but uh, it's so much fun. It's so much fun because we are in the entertainment business, uh, in the social life business, and especially after such a long year, it's so nice to see people uh, smiling again and just reconnecting. Something that we experienced in Europe, but it's not so popular here, but I think it would be so nice to develop this here. When we have weddings, yeah, so of course we create choreographies for the bride and groom, for the father-daughter dance and et cetera. But um, I remember back in year we were hired quite often to entertain and to perform at weddings and just to get the guests on the floor dancing. And I think that would be a very nice thing to do too. That's something that I, we would love to develop. And of course, a corporate team building. Dancing is therapy. It connects and makes uh, friendships and relationships stronger. So we would love to work with other businesses. How would you describe like your teaching style? Like it depends on the goals of the couple or of the student. If they are uh, more interested in competing, then of course, teaching is a little bit more detailed. Uh, maybe a little bit more athletic, so we make them dance a little bit more and sweat a little bit more. If it's more to just go out and social dance and to be able to have a good time, then we have a slightly different approach. But the most important thing is to be persistent. So I'm very persistent. You know, if something doesn't go well, I actually don't let go. I let I make sure that they do it a million of times. And then because, of course, you want to have it in the muscle memory, but it's important to stay positive. It's very interesting to see what's their favorite dance. Somebody who's more on the quiet side, you know, they like something a little bit more mellow, like a rumba, something more romantic. And somebody who's more active, of course, they always want to dance a tango or something more sharp. <laughs> um, now, if someone was like just starting out and trying to figure out what kind of dance they might be into, like, is there one that you would suggest that is a good starting dance? Absolutely. So, of course, it's always good to start with uh, slower dances because it gives us more time to think about the steps. But a very fun dance I recommend is always the salsa. It's a very fun Latin dance, uh, very popular in our community. And, of course, the swing. The music is great. What kind of goes into, I guess, keeping up your ability? The more you dance, the more fit you are. The biggest difference that we see, we have some uh, students who come in and they have maybe some balance problems or posture problems. And after a few lessons, it just makes a huge difference. So um, it helps with balance, with posture, coordination, and just overall, you know, being able to dance on beat uh, to the music, that's, that's a whole skill that you have to work on. <laughs> Now, ballroom dancing is a sport that has long been entrenched in traditional values and gender roles. Typically, the male leads and controls the couple's direction and timing, while his female partner follows and provides the fluid and expressive movement that makes it so beautiful. The National Dance Council of America and USA Dance only just started allowing same-sex and gender-neutral pairings at its sanctioned competitions two years ago. The World Dance Sport Federation rulebook, updated this past June, still defines a couple as, quote, a male and female partner, end quote. O'Connor wasn't immune from the pressures that come with being a woman in a sport that's slowly modernizing, but she says dancing gives her a sense of strength and freedom unlike anything else. Rather than leader and follower, she sees two people working together and floating across the floor as one, not unlike what you see in Olympic skating competitions. 
At Dancefire Studio, O'Connor teaches couples of all genders, sizes, and ages. They do offer stricter training for those who want to dance at a competitive level, but their general classes and themed dance parties focus more on the social and fitness aspects of the dance floor. O'Connor says she wants to bring the joy of the sport to everyone. It feels like therapy. It's dancing is definitely therapy. We all love to dance. We, we might say that we don't, but we love to dance. Even if we have two left feet, once you know, we play the music, it's, it's anybody can dance. All right, let's try with some music, the basic foxtrot. Well, let's put that to the test, shall we? Slow. Once I slip into some more comfortable shoes, I hand O'Connor the microphone so she can lead me through a few dance styles, starting with the foxtrot. My dance partner unfortunately lives on the other side of the country, but Florin is nice enough to help me out. So your right hand will be connected with his left hand, and you're putting your left hand on his shoulder. Very good. And now we're going to learn the basic step of the fox dress. So what you're going to do is you're going to step with your right foot backwards, then with your left foot backwards, then to the side with your right foot, and then you're going to close your feet. Wow, you're a talent. That's very good. One more time. So start with your right foot back, 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 side, close. And one more time. Back, back, side, close. And our timing is slow, slow, quick, quick. Keep on going. Slow, slow, quick, quick. And slow, slow. Look at you. You're fox strutting. <laughs> and slow, slow, quick, quick. And that is how you get around the floor. <laughs> All right. And so, like, how could, I'm trying to think, like, how people do that looking up. <laughs> well, <laughs> what happens is that, of course, you want to m keep your posture. And when you walk, you have to imagine you're always alternating your feet, right? So when you walk, you always alternate your feet. So it's the same thing in dancing. You never step twice with the same foot. And that's how you're not going to get stepped on. <laughs> but of course, practice makes perfect. So the more you practice, the better you get and you don't have to look down anymore. Five, six, seven, go. Slow, slow. Our last stop is at Jacob's Pillow, a dance center, school, and performance space in Beckett, Massachusetts. Jacob's Pillow recently wrapped its summer 2021 season, where it welcomed in-person audiences for the first time since the coronavirus pandemic. Helen Pickett is co-director of the center's contemporary dance program. She's created more than 40 ballets in the U.S. and Europe, her latest being a full length for the Scottish ballet titled The Crucible. Over the summer, Pickett adapted one of her early projects for the stage at Jacob's Pillow called Home Studies. I got to talk to her a little bit about her creative process and just how she got involved in choreography. I started with San Francisco Ballet training there. That is actually where I met William Forsyth. Ballet Frankfurt and William Forsyth was going to actually be my entire dance career. And then I retired relatively early, just turning 31, and I thought I wanted to be an actress, so I moved to New York. And I got a job with the Wooster Group, which is a theater group downtown on Wooster Street in New York City, and worked with them for five years, studied acting for two years. And then I realized that acting was not going to be my path, but I'm really happy I left dance to study acting because it has, and film, because it's turned into one of my passions as far as working with those elements in my choreography. In 1999, I also started teaching at the Ailey School, and I taught there for a decade. I was teaching Forsyth Improvisation Modalities. And um, in 2005, I was teaching exactly that for MIT in Boston. I would go around the country and teach um, Forsyth Improvisation Modality workshops. A friend who I'd known as a dancer, Miko Nissinen, had just gotten his directorship in Boston. And he left me a phone message and asked me if I wanted to choreograph for the main company. And it would become my first professional ballet company commission. I had made other work for the Ailey School kids, you know, for the school. And I'd done some film work, actually, some film choreography way back in the 2000s. But this was my first concert dance professional proscenium commission was with Boston Ballet, and it's been 16 years. I knew, without being dramatic or um, storytelling-ish, I knew the moment 
I was back in the studio that first day of rehearsal of my first professional piece that I was making. I knew that I, I'd found home. I'm so happy I went away because I realized it's where I actually, where my life's blood, where my breath was, where I found my reason for being in life. This iteration of Coast to Coast, which is the program at Jacob's Pillow, three of my first films that I made with three Boston ballet dancers, Leah Sirio, Paul Craig, and Michael Stromile. They were in the, my first three films, and these three films are now doing a reversal. They're making their way to the stage, and I have reworked them for the stage, but we are using the furniture that I used in the films. I've renamed it. It's called Home Studies, colon, Parlor Floor Life. It's just four different views of three people kind of maybe living together. You can make up your own story about that. And how they are dancing in their home space. I decided to keep it that way. So I kind of told you everything in one lump. <laughs> That's okay. I guess what's the difference between choreographing for film and choreographing for the stage? The beauty of film, and this is what I also took from when I studied film, is the very close, intimate detail that one can get with the camera lens, focusing in on an eyelash or the very intimate, very quiet look from someone to another someone. The intimacy of film for dance is something I want to discover more and fall into more because it's kind of the crux of my 16 year study in choreography anyhow. It's breaking the fourth wall through the sensory system, through proprioception, having the movement the connection between the people on stage jumping that fourth wall. It's been my focus of study, intimacy and how it can reach across the divide. So that is a big difference. And then, of course, the drama and the fun of live choreography on stage is that palpable physical prowess that you can only get on stage. It's the breath that you hear. So what I did is I just expanded the choreography more to fill more of the space. I made the gesture a bit bigger. And then it's the excitement of a live show that you can never see that exact performance again. I find it interesting the whole idea of playing, I guess, with the idea of intimacy and stuff like that as well. Tell me a little bit more about your work. Like, are there other themes that you like to explore in your work? Well, I've always been interested in narrative, and I think that's because my two parents were actors uh, when they met. So literature plays have always been a huge part of my life. I started working with narrative maybe 2008, yeah, with that duet with Sukyo. And then I made my first full length. That was a Tennessee Williams play. I did that when I was resident choreographer at Atlanta Ballet. And I fell in love, really, with full length. Like, if I could live in full length land from now on, I would. There's something so all-consuming, and it is just, like, the best meal you'll ever eat. There's so much detail. I made a second full length called The Crucible. It was about to go to the Kennedy Center and do throw around the country when the pandemic hit. So that'll come in, a, I think, a couple of years. And now I'm on to my third full length, which it's premiering in a few years. But we've already, we, I just had my first design meeting today for it. What is that process like? Like, how long is it usually to take for you to put a performance together? And I guess, where does it start? Well, my first full length, my father gave me the idea. And that was already back in 2012. And then I put it away. It was very complicated. It's, it's Tennessee Williams' most complicated play. It, it reads more like poetry. So I couldn't find my way through it as far as telling it in a, in a dance way. And then I did. So probably that full length from the time I really started thinking about it till its fruition, that was a three-year process. In the studio, it's anywhere from three to four months. But that so much preparation. You have to create a treatment for it, the scenes, 
talk to all the designers. For example, this is our first week of work for my new full length, and it won't premiere until the fall of 2024. You know, a portion for me, when I know something big is coming, a portion of my brain, even if it is subconscious, is always with that idea. Mm -hmm. So I have gathered hair sheets, newspaper articles. I've purchased five books. For me, it starts and lives with me until the premiere. When I was speaking to other people about just sort of like their experience in this field and whatnot, one thing I think people at least seem to think anyway is that choreography is a very male-driven field traditionally, and it's becoming more, like more and more women are becoming more prominent in it. I was going to ask, like, what has your experience been in this field, and are there ways in which you'd like to see it grow? Well, first of all, we have to make the distinction, because in other choreographic forms other than ballet, there are far more women as choreographers, I believe, and more women in leadership positions. I mean, you have to think of the modern dance movement and who started that. In the ballet world, that's uh, still true. It's still more male than female in leadership positions. Things have shifted. There is far more movement uh, as far as women getting into leadership positions and more movement as far as women of color getting into leadership positions, which is also extremely important. I just don't want it to be a fad. I want this movement of gender equity to keep going. And it's not just choreographers and directors, more female lighting designers, more female set costume designers, more female production managers, you know, just across the board. So we have more equity. I just want it to keep growing. When young people see people that look like them in positions, it makes them realize things are possible. Who are some of your inspirations? I have to say, this is kind of a stock answer for me, but it's absolutely the truth. I'm really inspired by the world around me. Anytime you can widen your idea about art, so go to your museums, read more, look to the living choreographers that were game changers, and there are quite a few that are alive right now. I'm a big proponent of people finding their own inspirations because it will mean more if you need to dance or if you need to be an artist you will find a way thanks for listening to this week's 51 percent 51 percent is a national production of wamc northeast public radio that theme underneath me right now that's lolita by albany-based artist girl blue A big thanks to Naoka Watterson, Natalia O'Connor, and Helen Pickett for sharing their experience and putting up with my two left feet. If you like what you're hearing, give us a like on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at 51% Radio. You can find this episode and others at wamcpodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next week, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl, I was nobody else, I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half, he was a hollow laugh, and I lost my cool somewhere along the way, at night and down the hallway, I had to learn how to look away, I lost my cool. Sweet.